All right, everybody, I, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, the time has come. So my name is Colby Johnston, and this is Brett Mayer behind me. We are both from Comcast and work on a team that is responsible for various cloud platforms. Um, we've been running Cloud Foundry for many years, uh, as we now call it CFAR, the application runtime. It's been a great PaaS environment for our cloud native apps and has done very well and our customers have been very, very happy with it. Um, today we hope to share with you a gap that we encountered as we work with customers over time. Many customers came to us with even modern applications um, that are very common today and, and they didn't quite meet the 12 factor app requirements. You guys can't hear? Should I? All right, how about that? Is that any better? Okay. All right, so many customers came to us with modern applications that they wanted to put in the cloud, um, but they fell short of the 12 factor app requirements that are really kind of required for uh, CFAR. And as a team, we recognized this. We wanted to help them, um, but really didn't have a solution or a platform to offer them uh, so that they can enjoy the benefits of being in the cloud. So today, we hope to share with you what we did for these customers and how, and how we helped them uh, uh, onboard onto the cloud. Now we as a team, uh, our focus really has been over the years to uh, help developers develop faster, build faster, and deploy faster. And we do this by uh, removing friction. And I just want to take a moment and describe what friction is. Friction can be a lot of different things, but primarily, um, you know, one of the big things is, you know, customer support. We don't believe in opening tickets. If customers need support, they just simply ping us on our Slack channel and we will respond uh, uh, immediately and give them the support they need. Um, other friction examples may be, um, um, you know, a DNS request or IP allocation or storage allocation. All these things slow developers down. They have to wait and there's delay. Um, and what we have done um, as part of our platform service is include uh, using, uh, uh, we call them add-ons to the, the platform to automate a lot of the pain, a lot of the delay away. And this has created a lot of uh, happy developers because it's fast and it's efficient. Uh, developers do not have to wait for these services and they can continue to move uh, faster. You know, we uh, do our best to take the friction away to allow the developers really to do what they do best, which is uh, write code. Now we've been doing CFAR for you know, over five years. We have uh, over 40,000 AIs and over 19,000 apps running, it's, it's a, a very large environment and it continues to grow at a very rapid rate. Uh, one of our biggest challenges really is just to simply keep up with demand of, of this platform. Now, uh, about five years ago, as I said before, we started out with uh, CFAR, which is one of the three, what I, I'm gonna call pillars of our, our cloud platforms that we offer as a, as a group. Um, and then shortly thereafter, we added um, Concourse is, uh, to provide a CICD type service. And now really between the two, this combination it allowed developers to move at speeds that I don't think they had seen before. And they were very, very happy um, uh, with, with this combination. Now, recently we added a third leg, I think, to the stool. And, and it is, it's CFCR, the container runtime. And at this point, we feel that we now offer um, complementary platform services that really offer and accommodate a wide range of application requirements. You know, it, it may seem a little bit odd uh, out of the same group to support, deploy, maintain two different platforms, AR versus CR, that really do have a lot of overlap in terms of features, functions, traits. But, but what we have found over the last year or so as we've been messing around with it is that they are much more complementary to each other 
than in competition. And I'll turn the time over to Brett. So in order to set the stage, um, I'm going to briefly touch upon the cloud native approach. Uh, just a couple of bullet points that kind of tie into what we're doing. So the first is time to market. And with the cloud native approach, you know, that allows businesses to deploy their applications and their services much faster by reducing the amount of time that developers have to spend uh, dealing with infrastructure. So like what Colby was mentioning, tickets, uh, DNS requests, provisioning this and that and the other, just dealing with the infrastructure. And in addition to that, um, by using uh, CICD practices and automating things when and where it makes sense, these organizations can get their applications deployed quickly, securely, uh, and predictably. The second point, uh, resilience and portability. So Cloud Native also empowers organizations to uh, you know, build and run um, or build and scale uh, loosely coupled applications that are resilient, they're easier to manage, and they're able to run on any cloud provider. And this in itself has a number of benefits, uh, such as reducing the application complexity. So by deploying or decomposing a traditional monolithic application into a set of smaller services. And these smaller services can be developed much faster, deployed easier, maintained easier. Um, and again, they're easier, uh, they run on any provider and they're portable. So with regards to our group uh, that Colby and I are in, uh, like he said, most of the success that we've had has been related to application runtime. And demand keeps growing for this platform and it's resulted in us creating um, a platform that's capable of running many of Comcast's most critical uh, application workloads. Despite this, we've had a number of customers that have come to us interested in moving into a cloud environment, but for one reason or another, we've had to turn them away. And some of these reasons being uh, perhaps their application is not fully decomposed. Maybe it's uh, only got a few microservices, but still primary, primarily monolithic. Perhaps they have a very resource intensive application, requires a lot of memory or CPU, such that might not fit into the application runtime environment. More than likely though, the reason is gonna be uh, statefulness or persistent storage. And any of these requirements that I've mentioned uh, kind of fall outside the realm of uh, 12 factor app principles and therefore aren't really suited for runtime or application runtime. And because of this, uh, these customers are stuck in traditional infrastructure again, VMs, physicals, what have you. And you know, that's not good for developers, the application, or the business. Um, again, we're stuck with infrastructure. So over the last 12 months or so, uh, we've been thinking about this problem, and we think that we've come up with the solution, which is CFCR. Thank you, Brett. Now, uh, Brett mentioned, uh, you know, how do we fill this gap? And we filled it uh, with using CFCR. Now, CFCR has some distinct traits about it that allow it to do very well at a few things that CFAR really does not. But let's first look at the left-hand column there and talk about what they have in common. Um, CFAR and CR that list you see there are common traits, and we could probably argue about which platform is better at what than the other, but I don't think there's really any argument that they're both good at those things. Um, now, in the right-hand column, we see CFCR, and those are the distinct traits that really separate it and make it distinct from AR. If an application uh, has stateful workloads, it's probably got to go somewhere else other than CFAR. If it requires the maintaining of state, if it requires the storing of data, um, we would counsel that customer, you know what, AR is probably not the best place for you, but we do have a place for you and it's called CFCR. 
And I will say this, uh, AR does abstract at a higher level than does CFCR. It, it, it abstracts more at the application level, uh, whereas CR abstracts more at the pod level. And at the pod level, you do need to worry about things like CPU, memory, and especially storage. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, um, even in today, we, we do have to still worry about things like CPU memory and, and storage. We just simply can't forget about it. If we do spend a little more time thinking about it and planning, uh, CFCR has a great way to accommodate these apps that require all these things you see here in the right-hand column. It, it does really well at stateful workloads. Um, and computing, and, and if your app has high compute needs, great place um, to put it. So <clears throat> statefulness in CFCR, really, you know, why, why is it so good um, at stateful, uh, accommodating stateful apps? Really, the, the one thing that separates it, I think, the most from AR is that first item in the list you see there is persistent volumes persistent volume claims. We're just gonna call it a PVC from here on out um, just to, because it's easier to say. Now a, persist, a PVC um, has the ability to store data and this is a very standard Kubernetes feature function. Um, it, um, and uh, the, the life cycle, let's talk about the PVC for a second. The life cycle of the PVC is independent of a deployment or a pod. You can scale your pod up or you scale your deployment up. You can even delete the pod in that deployment and you're gonna be able to keep your data because your data is sitting on a PVC which is completely independent of, of a pod. Um, now, the, the great thing about um, taking this little extra time to define your storage on Kubernetes is you do it one time. And once you do it, Kubernetes really takes care of the rest. Um, it knows where your pod is running and it's gonna take that volume and mount it to it. It could be running on any host or, or VM in that cluster. It'll find it and mount your storage there. It's a great thing. Uh, you do it once and forget about it. Um, but it, it really actually gets a little bit better than this. If you combine two ideas, the idea of a stateful set and a PVC, um, um, but before we describe the benefits of it, let's step back and talk about what the stateful set is. Now, a stateful set is a um, deployment of a set of pods. I kind of like to think about it as a cluster, an application cluster deployed in Kubernetes. And if you add the concept of a PVC to a cluster inside Kubernetes, you get something very powerful. You get a cluster that you can scale on demand uh, that can store data as well. Um, you know, that, that is a, a great thing. Um, now, uh, we've observed that uh, over the time that we've been using um, CFCR, um, that there's some common apps that take advantage of this combination of both stateful sets and, and PVCs. Um, examples of that might be uh, databases like Mongo and, and Cockroach or um, messaging you know, apps like Kafka. Um, these are all running in our environment right now. I did want to take a moment, and we do have a snippet of a deployment manifest for a stateful set. So I did mention it's a little harder, takes a little more time and thought, but it really isn't that bad. If we start at the top here, we see this stateful set will have five replicas. All that means, it's, it's going to deploy five pods. It's going to deploy a Kafka image. This is going to be a Kafka cluster. Um, if we go down further, we see that there is a volume mount. That var lib Kafka that we see there, that is where we're gonna keep and store our data. Below that, we see a volume claim template. That's really where we define the PVC. You see it's 300 gig in size. So each one of those five pods, replicas, will get its own unique um, storage volume that will attach to it. And if later we get down the road and it turns out, you know what, we really needed seven pods or seven replicas, we scale it up, it creates two more 
uh, volumes and attaches it to those two uh, additional pods. Um, you know, things like that are really easy in Kubernetes and there's a lot of value there and it's definitely well worth taking the time uh, to, to figure these things out. And like I said, it's, it's not that bad. Okay, uh, Colby just discussed the gap that CFCR fills and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the tool set that we use to deploy our CFCR clusters. So the brawn and the brains here. So we consider Bosch to be the brain and concourse, or I'm sorry, Bosch to be the brawn and concourse to be the brain um, out of this tool set. So Bosch is, really does the heavy lifting. So it manages that VM life cycle, the VMs that make up the base of this uh, CFCR cluster, the masters and the workers. Um, it also manages the software releases that, in this case, make up CFCR. So that's going to be Kubernetes, etcd, Docker, things like that. And besides that, Bosch also ties in very nicely with uh, CI/CD. In our case, um, Concourse. Now, speaking of Concourse, um, that's the brain. So that brings all these tools together. So Bosch, Vault, and GitHub. And by bringing these together, we, we define our deployments, and then we put that into a pipeline. And we're able to run this pipeline um, and deploy our clusters with uh, repetition. There's, there's going to be no change uh, in deploying those. And very little human intervention, so less prone to, uh, to five-finger mistakes and things like that. Um, Vault is our centralized key management. So that stores our certificates, tokens, super secret passwords, all that stuff. Things you don't want exposed in GitHub or scripts or manifests, anything like that. And then uh, GitHub, uh, that's used extensively by Concourse. So any, any repositories that are defined in our deployments, Concourse is going to pull that in, whether it's uh, source code or manifests, whatever. And it's going to use all these tools and build that deployment. So with regards to the deployment, uh, we keep those as vanilla as we possibly can. So even across cloud providers, whether it's uh, on-prem or off-prem, there's very little difference in what our, our deployment manifests look like. And as platform engineers, for us, this makes things a lot easier. As the configs are smaller, they're easier to maintain and easier to understand. And in addition to this, so we aim to keep uh, our clusters, CFCR clusters, all running at the current release. Uh, the current release cycle of CFCR is about every three to four weeks. And in order for us to maintain that, we need to have uh, a stable and a repeatable process. And by using these tools, specifically Concourse, it allows us to do that. So we just do a little bit of update to our uh, deployment regarding the CFCR version we want. We check that in the GitHub. We run the pipeline. And regardless of the environment or cloud provider, Concourse will run that and, and manage the uh, deployment. In addition to uh, just deploying uh, clusters and upgrades, we've also been able to leverage these tools to build our own patches. For instance, uh, last year there was a Kubernetes vulnerability. We were able to uh, build this patch, deploy it to our clusters 24 hours before uh, the official uh, release was uh, published on GitHub. So the flexibility that these tools give us, in addition to the platform itself, um, really allows us to move fast, stay secure, and uh, just keep everything um, stable and, and cookie cutter. So this is just a quick uh, snip of what uh, the deployment looks like from a Bosch perspective. Uh, it's really just one line there. You can see we, we uh, parameterize everything. Nothing is hard-coded. Um, we try and keep as, as few ops files as we can. And uh, again, keep everything simple. 
This is just a snip from the pipeline itself. And the reason I got this is because it, it shows how all the three tools, uh, Bosch, Git, and Vault, are used in the pipeline. So we're referencing two uh, repositories up there, the Git CFCR deploy. That's a, a private repository that we manage that contains uh, our manifest files and, and specific deployment information. The Kubo deployment, that's the official CFCR release, uh, used to be referred to as Kubo. Um, under the params list there, the first three, those are parameters used by Bosch, so that's going to define the name of the cluster, the IaaS that it's in, the environment. And then the last three are uh, vault parameters, and this is a good example of how Concourse is able to dip in the vault, get whatever secrets it needs, and populate them into the deployment. So none of this stuff is, you know, any, any of this secret information is not exposed into uh, plain text. <clears throat> so where are we at right now uh, with CFCR? Well, we are still in POC, but we do plan to go production very soon. Um, we have deployed it on-premise within vSphere, and we've also deployed it into our AWS, which is our, our primary cloud provider at Comcast. Uh, one of the, the advantages of, of CFCR that our customers just love is the, the fact that the user experience uh, for our developers is the same regardless of which cloud provider it's in. If our developers need a load balancer or they need storage or an IP address, um, they would define that exactly the same way whether it's an on-prem or an off-prem uh, deployment. It, it just simply doesn't matter to them. It looks, it feels, it smells, it's, it's all the same. They use exactly the same command or exactly the same uh, YAML definitions in, in their code. You could take um, what they used on-prem and deploy that same thing off-prem in AWS and guaranteed it will work because all of that is abstracted away with CFCR. Now this kind of goes back to the concept of reducing friction. This is big. Our developers can concentrate on their code and their application rather than trying to figure out all the individual differences and intricacies of the various cloud providers out there. Um, so it, it really has uh, been a big win uh, in that sense uh, for us as well as them. Now up until this point we've talked primarily about the benefits to our customers, the developers, uh, by utilizing CFCR, but I did want to take a moment and talk about uh, the effect that choosing CFCR has had on our team, what the benefit has been to the platform team. And when we started out in container orchestration, we started out with a different platform. And this platform required us to manage bare metal, uh, various operating systems, um, and, and tons of Ansible roles and playbooks and in many of the tools, in fact, almost all the tools were separate and distinct. They were not in common with the, the tool set that uh, the other half of our team was, was using for CFAR. And really what this did was it divided our team in two. You either did Kubernetes or you did CFAR, but not really so much both. Uh, by switching to CFCR, now we do have a lot in common with, with CFAR. The, the tool sets are are very similar, if not the same, uh, in most cases. For instance, we leverage um, Bosch um, for configuration management and VM deployment, uh, life cycle management for, for VMs. And, and by using this common tool, it's created synergy. Um, it's allowed us to share um, common practices and architectures and also the, the skill that we've gained can be leveraged across both CFAR and CR. Um, but it really hasn't been uh, without its challenges. Um, now this slide here depicts uh, that challenge. And like I said, this slide is a little bit graphic. There's a lot of death and destruction going on there. Um, but it, what it does do, it's, it's a really good depiction of the learning curve for Bosch if you haven't had experience with it before, which I have not. Um, and so, but, but over a little, using a little time and effort, 
um, I think for the most part, we have been able to get up over the hump and we're all up on top of the mountain there and we're in that DC-9 CAD clearing a path for higher team efficiency. So it, it's been uh, a good thing for our team and I think we're better for it. So we've gone through and described uh, what CFCR is, the gaps that it fills, how we deploy it, and all that is fine and great, but we didn't want to stop there. We wanted to provide more than just Kubernetes as a service. We really wanted to give the developer uh, a ready-to-use turnkey environment, again, reducing friction. So we took it upon ourselves to bake in some common features or services that most developers are going to need. So things like certificate management, DNS management, uh, ingress and egress networking, as well as uh, built-in integrations to some Comcast infrastructure such as logging as a service, monitoring as a service. So again, to reduce that friction, reduce hurdles, tickets, etc. And so that's great for the developer and that also developer helps us as platform engineers because it again provides us this cookie cutter approach to it. We're not installing things post deployment for a developer but not on that cluster or maybe on this one. Everything is the same so that leads to easier, easier troubleshooting in some instances, um, less customization and overall it gives us more time to continue to develop new services and new features for the developer and uh, allows us to streamline our approach and ultimately give an improved customer experience. So we want to shift gears just a little bit here and uh, I, I think finish by emphasizing Comcast's commitment to open source. Uh, Comcast, we are big believers in open source. We're not only users of it, but we also like to contribute back to it. And here on this slide, we do have a couple of, of examples of recent contributions um, back to the community. Um, Apache Traffic Control, Kuber Healthy, and there on the bottom, there is a URL uh, that you can go to if you like to you know, see that or even you know, clone it and, and try it out and give it a spin. We'd also like to invite you to stop by our booth and get some uh, free swag. Um, and also we are hiring and always looking for good people. And we do um, value diversity and inclusion. We do think it makes us a stronger and better company. With that said, we've come to the end of our uh, presentation and I think there are at least a couple minutes left and we'll open the time up for any questions you might have. Thank you. Yes, sir. Curious about uh, day two operations with some of the services you're running, the, the Kafka, MongoDB. Uh, you mentioned upgrades of the CFCR itself, but how about those services? Is the day two story for those Kubernetes workloads uh, fully baked? You know, I, I say we are the platform team and do work very closely with those that are deploying those, but we don't really dictate to them how they're going to do it in a lot of cases, uh, oftentimes, but um, um, just by nature of in putting those into Kubernetes with uh, our Docker Hub, upgrades are very easy. Customers do not have to worry um, about OS patching for sure. And when we patch our platform, we can do that in a rolling fashion that has zero impact to their application, which, which, is, which is great. Um, but I, I don't know that I have a full answer for you on you know, what it looks like to maintain Kafka day two. Um, I, I think we could probably find you somebody uh, that could speak a little bit better to that that's closer to it. Did you have anything to add to that, Brett, or? Well, yeah, uh, I mean, we have a few developers on our team that yeah. are more geared towards recommendations on how to configure things like Kafka. Um, so we could certainly get you in touch with those folks if you got any deeper yeah. questions on that. 
So I just want to add, you know, if you're really interested in talking about Kafka and, and how it's done, you know, in the container over time, um, we actually have a talk uh, that you know, one of our dev teams is giving, who is actually using Kafka screens on Kubernetes and, and you know, big and simple screen to uh, give you some more insight. It's actually happening right now. Yeah, of course, there's delayed oh. people. Oh. <laughs> 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 you know, you know, yeah. Is there another question? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, we're going to dictate the release and patch cycle of the platform, right. and we will work with them and say, hey, we're going to upgrade, and you need to make sure your application is compliant with what we're doing, but we're not going to dictate a particular release or patch for a, you know, a, an application, generally speaking. All right, anything else? Okay, oh, one more. Does that include... Yeah, those are, that's part of CFCR. So a new CFCR release may include, it probably won't be the latest and greatest Kubernetes. It might be like, like a minor release back, um, but that's all dictated in the CFCR release as to what version of Kubernetes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. No, we're, we could. I mean, well, we could easily roll back yeah, if we, if roll we back had to. Sure. Yeah. yeah, but we don't uh, make it a habit. So. All right. I think we're at the end of our time. So, if there are any further questions, we're going to be here for a while. So, please feel free to come on up and talk to us. Thank you.